Mr. Brown. I'm grateful, lady. Um, I'm just about to turn to second respondent's notice point, which yes. is Article 13, and that's to say that if I'm wrong in what I've said so far, my submission is that the payments on any view represent gains made on the alienation of an asset as a result, the UK would have taxing rights under Article 13, specifically 13.4 and 13.5. Please can I first put this submission in context and situate it in, in the running order of my arguments generally. This is an alternative case. My primary case is and remains that Article 6 applies. And so I make this submission on the footing that I'm wrong mm. about, about Article 6. The nub of what I'm saying on this second respondent's notice point is that the two reasons that RBC advances as to why Article 6 does not apply in this case mean, and they can only mean, that we would be dealing here with gains. Now, let me explain why. In relation to RBC's point on Grand Tour, it said, so that's Grand 1, it said that Article 6 doesn't apply because Solpetro alienated the right to work and an alienation or transfer, it said, cannot be within Article 6. And on ground two, the point taken against me is that we are dealing with the sale of shares, not a transfer of the right to work, as it said, well, the right to work is in the company, the right to work never moved, the shares moved. Now, either way, we are dealing with a transfer of rights. So whether, whether the court is against me on either or both of um, ground one and ground two, we're dealing with a transfer of rights. And in making those two <coughs> grounds of appeal, the learned friend has lent heavily on Article 13. And if we look at Article 13 in the UK-Canada Treaty, so within the authorities, volume, sorry, volume 1, tab 4, page 51 is Article 13. The two provisions with which we're concerned are 13 sub 4 little b and 13 sub 5 little a. And as I understand it, there's no dispute that on the footing that we get to this point in the analysis that rights that were transferred were the right to the oil. So that would be Article 13.4b, rights to assets to be produced by the activities referred to in little a. And as for the shares in SUKL, the only meaningful asset that SUKL had was the license. And so on the footing that we're dealing with gains, those shares would be, um, would be within um, 13.5 little a, because they would derive their value from the license that's um, identified in 13.4 little a. That's the premise of this. Now importantly, under the scheme of the treaty, the UK has the flexibility to tax gains in respect of which it has taxing rights under domestic law in the manner that it chooses. And in particular, and this is critical for this point, the UK could choose to tax a gain in respect of which it has taxing rights under Article 13 as income. And for that proposition, I rely on the OECD's commentary to Article 13. And one has this uh, in the 2005 iteration, Authorities Volume 3, Tab 29, starting at page 823. 823? Yes, page 823. Thank you. Well, I meant to clarify this earlier, I think it was. We're generally going to the 2005. So, well, I, I've, done, I've done that principally because it's the version that a friend took the court to, so it's to save you marking up 
two different versions. Okay, but so to be accurate... Um, 17 is the, the current version. 17 is the current version. The, the relevance of the version we're looking at is what? It was closest to the date that, of the well, treaty? Or? I, I infer that that was the version of the commentary that was current at the time of the years of assessment with which we're concerned. But no, I friends see. Nodded. I think that's what Mr Peacock said yesterday. Okay. I've simply done it out of convenience. I've got no objection to us opening 2017. I've only well, gone to five, really. I, I was going to put it the other way around. If, if no one has an objection with using the 2005 version, we'll use the... Yes, that's fine. You're not expecting us to look at other versions? I'm not. I can get what I, I, can get what I need from five. Um, though, as the court will appreciate, that it might have been one Irish bank seven was one where there was a lot of debate about different versions of the commentary. Uh, I hesitate to say it, but I, I haven't detected a difference that matters. So it, right. it hasn't seemed to me to be necessary to say to the court, you need to look at 2017 for this as well and yeah, think about you. whether it's clarificatory or, or not. So I, I'm very content that we simply look at, at those points. Um, what I'm relying on, um, because I say that these paragraphs are a, are a complete answer to the upper tribunal's rejection of my submission on this point of paragraph 140 of its decision. What I get from these paragraphs is paragraphs 1 to 3 on the preliminary remarks, and it's paragraph 4 when it gets into the commentary on the provision under general remarks. Is, the, is this proposition that Article 13 does not specify how capital gains are to be taxed. What Article 13 is concerned with is the allocation of taxing rights. If a contracting state has taxing rights because Article 13 applies, the manner in which gains are to be taxed is left up to the contracting state. In particular, the contracting state may decide to tax those gains as income. And one can see, first of all, in paragraph one, there is a recognition that if one looks across the tax of OECD member countries, that the taxation of capital gains varies considerably. And you can see in the three bullet points under paragraph one, there are different uh, methods of taxation that may be applied in respect capital gains, so not deeming them to be taxable income, um, special treatment in relation to enterprises, taxation in specified cases. And then the point is reiterated that the taxes on capital gains vary from country to country in the first sentence of paragraph two. Importantly, in the second sentence is a recognition that in some OECD countries, those capital gains, they are taxed as ordinary income. But here they're not. I'm sorry, my lady? But here they're not, are they? They're not, they're not what? They're not I'm taxed so as ordinary income. Well, they're taxed as income. Well, yeah. I don't, <laughs> I've I just, don't. there's a prior question, which is, they've got to be capital gains. They've got to be gains. Exactly. And, and, I, and, I'm, going, and I'm going to... You will address I'm going that. to address you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm just no, no, no. confused. There's, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but the, um, there's no magic in the term or, ordinary mm. income. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, you first have to ask, have we got gains? Yes. I, I need that to, yeah. to get within Article 13. That, that's absolutely right. The reason You're saying, have we got gains? I'm in Article 13. Then it's up to the uh, country itself to decide exactly. to how to tax that um, profit in the widest sense. Yeah. Um, and here, why not do it by income? But once it's... does, Are you saying, therefore, you have to say it's a gain to get into Article 13, but when you come out of Article 13 and you come into the domestic realm, yeah. you can then re characterize it not as a gain so that you can call it purely income yeah, I can call it income and, th and that's so is that not caking and eating no no, no. it's not what, what, we'll, what we'll see is that the, 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 if anyone's trying to have it both ways in this case in my submission 
question, it's Milan Friend, because the arguments that are advanced to turn off Article 6 actually compel the conclusion that the receipts that we're talking about are in the nature of gain. I, I'm not... Well, let's, let's stick to your argument, no, so that I understand it, and, that no, I, I, and I'm very eager for you to elucidate it. It has to be a gain to be in Article 13. Yes. Once I'm in Article 13, you say, uh, then I exit Article 13 into the domestic realm, and the convention tells me, I'm sorry, the treaty tells me, that it's up to me in my domestic sphere to do what I want and to exit how I like. Yeah. So now I say it's income. How do we therefore gravitate, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just you'll have to take it very slowly, how do we gravitate from deciding it's gain from one purpose and then deciding it's up, we can, we can characterize it differently? Well, because the, the, there, are, there are two different exercises going on. One, yes. one, is, one is what taxing rights have been asserted by the UK and set up. No, I so understand. That's, that's what the treaty is about, it's, and it's about uh, uh, Money, well, who's, who's doing what in relation to tax. What I just said was about what the UK is, <coughs> yes. um, has the UK sought to charge the payments to tax. That yesterday was the point I started with, saying that's actually where one could should begin. Mm. The convenience in the, in this case, and I've just followed Melania Friend's approach in this for, for better or for worse. Um, the grounds of appeal start with the treaty. Yeah. Um, there are two very different exercises going on. One one is working out. What is it that the UK is entitled to tax? And for that purpose, one is looking at whether one, one, one of the questions one has to deal with is has one got either income on one hand or gains on the other yes. for, the, for the purposes of the treaty, thing, thing, thing one. The application of the articles of the treaty will tell you whether it's the UK only or the Canada only, or yes. perhaps even both, or perhaps even neither, that has the taxing rights in respect of the payments. There is then an entirely separate question, well, which is to say, what has domestic law actually done in relation to the treatment for domestic tax purposes of those payments? And the burden for showing you this commentary is that there's a recognition in the commentary that you do not necessarily have the, the, the same answer in terms of how the payment is treated, first of all, at the level of the treaty, and secondly, in domestic law. And so there's nothing odd about uh, having to categorise it as a, a gain in order to be under Article 13, mm -hmm. but coming out into the domestic world and uh, characterising it differently. Absolutely right. That's, 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 that's the burden that's the of issue my... That's, yeah. Yeah. That's the burden of my case in Article 13, and I, I absolutely accept that I must satisfy you that what we are dealing with is gains within the meaning of Article 13. Okay. And when you do, when you do that, do we need to take account of Article 3.2, which says firms not defined um, yes. unless other context otherwise required? The meaning given you, given under the law relating to taxes yes. is that not relevant that, in that, relation to that, gains? That is relevant. Yes. Yes, I accept that. So on the face of it, gains, which is not, I think, otherwise defined in the treaty, is something that you um, had to look at UK domestic. You would, st you would start off look at looking at UK domestic principles. That's why, my lady, I started this by saying that it's very important to, to appreciate how it is that this point arises. So I only get to this point in Article 13 if you're against me on ground one and or ground two. I think we are. Con con consequence of which is that we are dealing with the transfer of assets. That would conventionally in the UK be characterised as a transaction that's of a capital nature and at least is capable of giving rise to capital gains. What I'm not saying and what I don't need to say is that the specific charging provision that has been applied by the UK in its domestic law is a provision of the capital gains tax code. I don't need to say that. Mm. What I'm doing is I'm living in a world where the court is against me 
on grand one and or grand two. And what I'm saying is, okay, let's live in that world. What's, what's the basis for that conclusion? And the basis for that conclusion has to be that there is a transfer of a right, because it's set against me on ground one. Well, it's an alienation. That's why 6-2 is turned off. If it had been a grant, it would have been fine, but alienations don't count. That's ground one. Yes. And on ground two, it is said, there is a transfer of shares in a company. That's why there isn't the right to work. Both of those transactions, if one is looking, as my lady, lady Justice Scott rightly says, looking um, to domestic law for how that should be characterised as a matter of um, tax principles, domestic tax principles, would be seen as disposals of a capital nature. Okay. So that's my gateway. So I can see that in relation to Sol Petron. Yeah. Um, Clause 30, um, Article 34 and 5 yep. would appear to be in point. There would be a question, Marilyn Ingalls was mentioned yesterday, there would be a question as to, um, well, it's highly likely that the way it would be viewed for capital gains purposes in the UK is full petro would have been taxed on CGT principles on the consideration Plus, let's assume it is part of the consideration for these purposes, um, the right of shows in action um, the, of, of the uh, right to receive these furloughs payment notes. Indeed. And what I say at that point is that if we're going back to Article 13, that the right way of looking um, at the receipt, and I'm just dealing with Sol Petra here at the moment. I've yes. got po points to make, but once we get to the bank, well, it's quite a short, <coughs> and, and dare I say, simple point. Um, in Article 13 terms, one would say that if I just call them the clause 5.4 payments, I hope we all yes. know what um. I'm talking about. Let's call it a bit of simplicity. Um, that they still represent gains from the alienation of the right to the order uh, and the alienation of the shares. There isn't some recharacterization that because you say, well, it's a shit, that because clause 5.4 is a shows in action, that that somehow, yeah, changes, that that somehow changes the nature yeah. of, what's, of what's going on. Um, what, what I haven't quite properly done is shown you. Um, all of the commentary I was looking to, to, to show you. Could, could I just finish doing yeah. that and then yeah. come, and then come yeah. back to the, to the questions of, of principle? Um, so what I've also done is, um, is mislaid my choice. We were on 823 for the commentary. I'm very grateful. Um, yes, we were. It's my instinct always to go to 2017 and then to have to go back to very grateful indeed. I think I was on paragraph two. Yes, you were. Um, and I hope I've dealt with the point about ordinary income and how that doesn't count against or rule out the, um, the point that I was making. <coughs> and you can see, for example, in um, I think it's the third sentence starting, in a number of OECD member countries, you see ca capital is subject to special taxes. Now, the particular example is one on profits, broader concept than gains, um, from the alienation of immovable property, etc. Et and then they say, we don't need to describe all the taxes. And then three, the article doesn't deal with the above-mentioned questions. And then it's the second sentence, it's left to the domestic law of each contracting state to decide whether capital gains should be taxed, and if they are taxable, how they are taxed. And the third says, I, I need, of course, to find a right in domestic law. Yeah, we'll get to that. That's another problem because there, there is an assertion of taxing rights here. It doesn't specify to what kind of tax it applies. And then in paragraph four, 
first sentence explains a little bit of a clue about some of the background thinking to this. They're looking particularly at business assets in this context. Uh, but it's the, the last two sentences. It's left to the domestic law of the tax and state to decide whether a tax on capital gains or on ordinary income must be levied. The convention doesn't prejudge this question. And that's my point. Once we've characterized for treaty purposes what we've got as a gain, we then have to ask, well, which limb, if any, of 13 are we within? And what we'll see is there's a, there's a default fallback limb in 13, and there are then more specific limbs. You use that to work out which contracting state it is that has the right to tax the gain. Once you've got to that stage, you then look to the domestic law of that particular contracting state. And it is up to the domestic law of that taxing state to decide, in particular, whether it's a strictly so-called capital gains tax or whether it's tax on income. The treaty has nothing to say about that choice and doesn't limit that choice. So that's the point as a matter of structure. And that commentary in my submission addresses, if one has the upper tribunal decision, because this, this is where the upper tribunal said, well, we're not going to accept this alternative argument in 140. They said very shortly, without referring to the commentary, halfway through 140, bundle page 93, it seems wrong, they said, that a sum of money which becomes eligible for taxation within the UK as a gain within the meaning of Article 13 can then be taxed in the UK in whatever way the revenue wishes, regardless of the status of the relevant sum of money. And they said that seems to extend too far the flexibility given to contracting parties. And I say that's not, that's not so. Um, the treaty's work is done once it allocates the taxing rights. Once the UK has the taxing rights, the UK has the choice. And it could apply um, capital gains tax, or it could apply um, a charge that's an income tax charge. Now, in this case, what the UK is doing is taxing profits. Um, you, you can see that in, in 1313, at um, bundle page 279. And it's treating particular profits as profits of a trade. But the important point in my submission is that in order to escape Article 6, what the learned friend has to say is that actually the, the correct characterization of the Salpetro BP transaction is to see that transaction as one that gives rise to, to capital gains. That's the consequence of the, the arguments that are being advanced in order to escape Article 6. And as I've said, if we look at the consequences of that, then we have Article 13.4, little b, telling us that gains from the alienation of the right to the oil, that they may be taxed in the UK, and then similarly in relation to 13.5, little f, gains from the alienation of shares of the particular kind, and I say we have shares of the particular kind, those gains may be taxed in the UK. Now, in his skeleton, supplementary skeleton, this is Manana Krem, so I think it's 10 and following. His first response, which he didn't develop already, um, but I'll deal with what he said in writing, is to say, well, this can't apply because we're not dealing with gains. Um, but we're looking at a circumstance where RBC is the assignee of Salpetro. We looked at the assignment. RBC stepped into the shoes of Salpetro. And the court has, my think that what must be being said here is that the reason why Article 6 doesn't apply is that if we're looking at the Salpetro BP transaction, that transaction is a disposal on capital account. That's inherent in the submissions that have um, been made. And so the response that's made, I think it's paragraphs 12 and 13 in the supplementary skeleton, say, well, we're not dealing with, with gains. Um, true it is, we're not dealing with a domestic tax charge that is part of the capital gains tax code. We're not looking at the 1992 Act. But that's not the question. What, what we've done is we've been engaged in characterizing the nature of the Salpetro 
BP transaction. And in the world that we need to live in, assuming this argument arises, I've lost an Article 6 because the court has held that there's a transfer of rights and a transfer of shares in the company. So that's the answer to um, the, what's said to be the, the first point, which is paragraph 12 in my friend's supplementary skeleton, and also the first part of his second point which is to make the same point by reference to the OECD commentary. And I just say, no, that's a misunderstanding of what's going on here. It's a two-stage exercise. Look at matters here um, for the purposes of the treaty. Look at matters here for the purposes of domestic law. I don't really mind which way around you, you, you do it, but they're two different um, exercises. The point which my friend did develop orally yesterday is the point at the end of his um, paragraph 13 in the supplementary skeleton, which is now dealing with the position of RBC. And that's to say, as he did at page 123 of yesterday's transcript, that article 13 is restricted to the alienator. And he said, well, the bank didn't alienate anything. I think the transcript says anybody. I think we can all agree that it's a, a typo. So, what my learned friend is saying is that Article 13 is dealing with a disposal of assets by the person you're trying to tax. Because what, as he puts it in his skeleton, it's a treaty right under Article 13 to charge gains made by the alienator. And my learned friend is saying, well, those gains are in the hands of somebody else. You can't use Article 13 to, to tax RBC. That proposition, in my respectful submission, is wrong. It's wrong because if we look back to Article 13 in the UK Canada Treaty at page 51 of Volume 1 of the Bundle of Authorities, we'll see that in Article 13, it's 4 and 5 that I'm particularly interested in, that the object of scrutiny for the purposes of those provisions is the gains. It's not the alienator. It's not gains realized by a particular person. The taxing rights are not limited by reference to the alienator. We're asking really two questions. We're asking, one, are there gains? And I've addressed the court on, on that. And we're asking, are those gains from an alienation of rights or of shares of the relevant kind. And if they are, then those gains can be taxed in the state, put short, in which the petroleum, if we're looking at 13.4, is situated. So 13.4 and 13.5 don't refer to gains realized by the <coughs> alienator or anything like that. And if we're looking at this contextually, if one reads on to 13 sub 8, the court will see that when the draftsman wants to refer to the status of the alienator, he does so. 13 8 is the general fallback rule. So if you're, out, if you're outside 1 to 5, then the gains are taxable only in the contracting state of which the alienator is, is a resident. Um, but none of that gets us away from the point that what we're focusing on in Article 13 is the gains. It's not particular gains that were realized by and paid to Solpetra. It's just gains. What we have in this circumstance is a scenario where RBC has taken an assignment of Sulpetro's right to be paid, that which is paid is, in my submission, gains within those provisions in Article 13. So saying, well, RBC didn't alienate anything is not an answer to my case on Article 13, because Article 13 is not limited by reference to whether it's the alienator that is sought to be taxed. <coughs> 
that's the submission on the second respondent's notice form. And as I've said, it, it involves accepting the premise that must underlie a, a conclusion, allowing the appeal on ground one and ground two, and then asking, okay, what does that mean? And that's my submission on, on what it would mean. Those are the points I wanted to make on the treaty. That takes me then to ground three and the domestic law position, which raises a short point of statutory construction on section 13, 13 uh, sub 3 uh, 2 to B. Both tribunals below held that the payments were profits within 1313-2B, which is on page 297 in the authority. Is someone more? Yeah. Yes, I, I'm, sorry, did I say some, I'm sorry, did I say something else? I 97, it's okay, we're there. Very sorry, 279, that was certainly what I should have said. Um, 279. looked at the definition of exploration or exploitation rights with Unan Chai yesterday. And the particular part of the definition <coughs> that we're interested in is rights to the benefit of such assets. And such assets, of course, are assets to be produced by exploration or exploitation activities. And that, of course, is the previous definition in subsection 3. So one could do a I suppose a sort of interpolating exercise of reading in the, the various um, definitions. The important point in my submission is that we're dealing with a definition here where the draftsman has extended and then continued to extend the, the scope of the notion of exploration or exploitation rights as he starts with rights to assets of the particular kind. That, in my submission, is then expanded to include interests in such assets, and then it's expanded again to include rights to the benefit of such assets. Now, my friend says that in order for RBC to have rights to the benefit of the oil, it would have needed not just a contractual right to a sum of money, but also a legal claim on the oil itself. But we know from the structure of section 1313.3 that a right to the benefit of the oil, it's separate from, and it's not dependent upon having either a right to the oil or a right to an interest in the oil, because these are three different ways of satisfying the definition. And so it doesn't matter in my submission that RBC receives a benefit that doesn't give them a legal or equitable interest in the oil itself. It doesn't matter that RBC doesn't have some legal or equitable claim on the oil, particularly in circumstances where, at least in this jurisdiction, when it comes to proprietary matters, this court, the courts would declare entitlements that exist. The court is not giving remedial proprietary remedies, creating new, new proprietary interests, for, for example. If we look at what's happened in this case, if you look at the position um, before the execution of the SPA, you have Sulpetro, the parent, which as we saw when we looked at the illustrative agreement, it, it has in particular the right to the oil one. So Sulpetro owns the oil that's won from Buckley. That's the position before the sale to the And then as part of the consideration for the, the wider deal, um, the clause 5.4 rights are created. And if one asks, well, what, what is that doing? The clause 5.4 rights are giving Sulpetro. One might put it in terms of a, 
the continuing interest in the production from Bakken. I don't need to go that far. The upper tribunal wasn't prepared to go quite that far. But it certainly gives Silpetra the right to the commercial benefit of the oil that's won from Bakken. Because what we're dealing with, and we, we saw the terms of the royalty itself, I don't think I need to ask the court to turn up clause 5.4 again, we're, we're dealing with sales of actual production from Bakken. So it is the very barrels drilled out of the Bakken tube, sold at a particular price. And what happens in, in very broad terms is that there's a sharing in the upside, initially on the, on the part of Sepetra, um, insofar as the price of the, the price realized is above the specified price, which is twenty dollars a barrel. So you can absolutely see in commercial terms <coughs> Sulpetro was getting the commercial benefit of the oil won from the Buchan field in, in part. Not not all of it, of course, because you had to, to reach the trigger price and insofar as it was above the trigger price, there was a sharing <coughs> with BP. And the assignment doesn't change anything. RBC is simply now the recipient of the fruits of that right. And so RBC equally has, by virtue of the assignment, um, the right to at least part of the commercial benefit of the oil. Now, that doesn't mean that Section 1313 is somehow open-ended. What I'm saying is that when one looks at this tripartite definition, the, con the context of that definition supports the conclusion that the term, the benefit of, denotes a, a broader and less legalistic concept than either right to or interest in the oil. And in terms of principle and policy, that makes perfect sense because Parliament would not want the tax base to be hollowed out as a result of contractual arrangements which allow effectively a profit share. And it's not an answer um, in, in my submission to say, well, it's got to be the benefit of the oil, or to say, well, the definite article makes all, all the difference and compels a conclusion there has to be some kind of claim on the oil itself. The, the syntax may not be absolutely the easiest, but if one, for example, were to substitute in the word from, the benefit from such asset, one doesn't actually change the fundamental question of what, what, sort, of, um, what sort of rights is this provision actually seeking um, to turn. Can, can I ask you? Yes. Do you have anything to say about the um, propriety of HMRC accepting the deductibility of the payments, and as far as Talisman is concerned, because it was a point Mr. Peacock made that that, that was really <coughs> the real problem that they had was, and they got that wrong. Um, I mean, in the sense that that is what has happened. I think my position is my, my client's um, um, position is that that was correctly done. I think no one is trying to revisit that. Um, and the <laughs> and, and probably can't be done now, now anyway. As to as to whether it's as to whether it's as to whether it's right or not. Um, I mean, do we do we need to form a view of it? Um, the reason I ask that is because you said the government couldn't possibly have wanted to, to see that if there was a profit share, then half the, the benefit would, would disappear from the tax net. But that does depend upon saying, well, Talisman's, the deduction of the payment made by Talisman was something that was properly done. Because otherwise, um, well, you could I'm, simply say, well, you, you might balance out. I, mean, I think that the, the, the submission would be that it, it has been correctly done. As I say, no, no one is seeking to, to revisit that. Um, but, but that it's not quite the same as us taking it as the correct legal starting point. 
that payments of this nature are deductible and therefore that, that is relevant somehow in construing this? Because that's more or less what you're saying. It's not, actually. What I'm asking the court to do is to focus on the receipt. It, it's my own friend who, who wants to say, well, it's balanced out by a deduction, so it doesn't matter. No, but you are um, saying what, what Parliament should be taken to have intended, so it's relevant to that extent. That, that well, you're, you're suggesting profit shares of this kind should be caught, but that is based on the premise that the payment's deductible. I'm not sure it is, my lady, but, but um, what, what I'm asking the court as I said, to, to, to do is, is, to, is to focus on, on, the, on the receipt. Um, and whether or not I would be right about deductibility, um, it is absolutely correct to, to note that you have this expanding um, mm. definition at, at each of the stages. And those words, rights to the benefit of, they, they do something in addition to the words rights to or interest in. And one, one of the objections that, that I make to the, to the meaning uh, for which my friend is contending is that that meaning would be coextensive. It certainly wouldn't add anything to the notion of an interest in the employment. So my case doesn't, doesn't depend on the revenue being correct to have accepted deductibility of payments by talisman. Um, yes, I mean, the when it was discussed yesterday, um, Peacock said, oh, I'm not saying, you know, it needs to be an entitlement to all 1,000 barrels of oil, um, could be 900, but you, you could see a situation where, for example, an, an interest in assets is, is some sort of right, pro property right, claim on those particular barrels of oil coming out of the ground. Um, but you could see that the benefit of the assets might be something slightly different. For example, the right to delivery of an equivalent amount of oil, not necessarily that oil. What we've got here is something slightly further removed. We've got an amount of money dependent on a sale by the person actually entitled to the oil, BP or talisman, and then a passing over of part of the benefit. Well, it is one further step. We, 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 we have a, a bit more, if I may respectfully say so, my lady, than, than what your ladyship has, has just said, in, in that we have uh, a right to a sum of money. It's from the sale of actual oil. Um, it's being paid to the person who previously owned the oil. That is an important feature um, of this. Um, if, if one is looking at it, take it in stages. If one's looking, for example, at the point about a particular barrel or, or the like, I'd respectfully submit that doesn't take one any further with this provision because it talks about assets and plural and, and generally. It's not. It's not talking about <coughs> specific. Well, it's, it's, the or it's talking in, in general terms about assets to be produced. So, so it wouldn't be said that it needs to be, it wouldn't necessarily um, sp specific barrels out of a series or something. I, I may have not quite followed the point your ladyship was making. But I, well, I was I just. I was on the, the just, point about proportion. Yeah. Uh, the point about plural would not necessarily answer that. It was more that. Uh, you can see why the draftsman might not want to restrict it to a proprietary interest in the, those particular barrels of oil, not least because I think oil is fairly fungible. Um, so one narrower approach than the one you're advocating would be that it would cover, for example, a right to be delivered an equivalent amount of that sort of oil whether it's from this particular no, field or not. No, if, if, if one looks at, at this provision in, in context, what we're interested in is it exploration or exploitation. And what we're interested in is, is the turning of the oil to the <coughs> and in And in that context, I, I would 
submit that it's not, uh, it wouldn't be the right place to be drawing the line at saying, well, you get what you're within this provision if you have a right to delivery up of oil or an equivalent amount of barrels, but you're not within the provision if what you have is a right to the money produced by selling, uh, for example, the very same barrel. Mm. That, that wouldn't, in my submission, be a, a, a sensible way of interpreting that notion of, of, mm. of benefit in the context of a provision of this nature. If, if that's right, can you also comment on the potential implications of, of that sort of approach beyond the confines of this case? Because that's something Mr. Tukos also this is what the, the, the point about um, lenders and financiers. And the well, yes, and the lenders. Let's take lenders. I mean, it, it, we're not we're not in a treaty framework now, where I know you made the point that the treaty works by looking at Article Eleven for lenders. We're now in a domestic world. Do you have any comments to make? Well, if, if you're looking at lenders in the context of thirteen. You, you do end up in, of course I don't in Article 11, but you end up actually with a, a similar analysis, which is that you ask why is it that the lender is getting this return? It's getting this return um, as lender. It, it isn't to do with, or, or rather it's not a circumstance where the lender previously owned the oil, sold it to someone else on a particular basis. That's the particular situation that we are dealing with here, um, because I, I don't accept that the interpretation that has been endorsed by the first view in the upper tribunal would mean that uh, a lender of the type that Malcolm Tukas has been referring to, that they would be taxed under Section 1313. That's, that's ignoring um, the the particular factual context that, that underpins the conclusion that 1313 is engaged here. Even for a secured loan with security over the oil as it comes out? Oh. If they're getting their return as lender, then that should be the nature of the tax treatment. Is and that HMRC's position? Well, you probably would well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, that I can okay. answer that on my just now. Um, but your, one, your one, position... Could, one, one, could, one could hypothesize a set of errors, <coughs> but um, there might be a Yeah. like a loan, but actually yeah, they're not behaving like a lender at all, because actually they are participating. Um, well, production sharing, I think. Yes. Um, but that, that's not the sort of example that, that, I, that, that I'm talking about or that I understand you to be, to be okay. putting. Um, but I, I don't accept that there's some sort of catastrophic wider consequence if um, the um, FTT and the UT are upheld in this form. The way that, um, in my submission, this, this aspect should be seen is that it's the product of the, the, particular, <coughs> the particular circumstances where you have a party that was entitled to the oil one, and it has sold that entitlement to oil, and it's replaced it with a right to payment, which gives it the right to a substantial proportion of the commercial benefit of can you just help me with where in section 1313 is that linked to the prior sale of the right? Because what we're talking about here is profits from the rights to assets to be produced. I'm, I'm not sure how the earlier sale makes, makes the difference. 
previously been the owner. I can, I can see that. If that, that does happen to be true in this particular case, that that's what we are dealing with. Where it may come in is if one's looking at whether the whether the whether the person realising the profit we, we need a profit that's what we're looking yeah. at um, whether they've got the benefit of the order ultimately one could see that as a fact dependent question so I suppose one of the points that, that one would take into account is the prior right in, in making that assessment. It may not be a requirement, necessarily. So, my lady, in, in my submission on um, ground three, the tribunals below, they were right essentially for the, for the reasons that they gave. And, and it is ultimately, it's a short point of construction. Mm. Um, particularly important is the, the statutory context and also the legislative technique of expanding the definition beyond um, rights to and interests in. <coughs> and in my submission, there's no, there's no error um, committed uh, in holding that payments um, are profits within 1313. Three. Can, can I ask you, just Please. before you leave this point, do we get any assistance one way or the other from the Corporation Tax Act 2010, which we have in the next tab, which contains a definition of oil rights at 273, which is all in the same term? And I don't think I've quite understood whether the 2010 Act is a consolidation of something that was in force at the time of the 2009 Act, whether it's all part of the same legislation, or whether it does something entirely different. The, the rewrite was done in two stages and dealing, dealing with different topics. Um, the I'm sorry, uh, the, the book I brought with me um, stops just before the CTA 10, but um, I don't know if it help, helpfully reminds me um, that what the, the particular chapter within which you find um, 273, what that's doing is it's setting the ring fence. That's what one will, will find. Um, in well, the CTA 10. The CTA 10, yes, is, is dealing with the, with the ring fence. Um, there's no particular um, <coughs> there's no particular read across I don't think from the definition of oil rights in 273 in the 2010 Act back to the provisions in 1313 in the 2009 Act no but it is it is the same words and if I'm understood correctly it's 279 which, which treats Oil related activities as a separate trade and sets up yes. the ring fence. Yes. And oil related activities seems to be defined by 274 and includes activities consisting of the enjoyment of oil rights. So if you're right that RBC's receipt is a separate ring fence trade, is that, yes, is that right. how it works? Yes, that, that's, that's correct, if, if, if I'm right. And there were arguments uh, below that are no longer pursued about the um, whether there could be a deduction effectively ag against the receipt. For the bad debt they wrote off. You'll see, you'll see discussion of that in yes. the FTT in the upper tribunal, but that's no longer live now. But one of the reasons why my clients say there's no deduction, that was to do with the ring fence. Okay, thank you.
Yes, I can see some further. Maybe those, those, those are my. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Brimmer and Mr. Peacock. Just in relation to that last point, let me come back to it. There was a date of debate below about whether we could set off the loss that we have suffered and indeed are still suffering. And it was said again that you can't because it's a separate trade. We're going to discuss having one's cake and eating it. That's um, an example on the, the revenue side. There we are. Um, ground you, you've set it off against your Canadian tax loans as, as a bad debt in Canada. We did. Yeah. And the sums that are sums that have been received have been treated as taxable income that reverse the, that. It's a right back of the bad debt you wish not. Yeah. Uh, on which we're taxable in Canada. Yeah. Um, so the debate below was: Well, if you're going to tax us in the UK, can't we have the benefit of the loss we've suffered? And it was said no. Yeah. Be that as it may, um, ground one interpretation of six two to remind the court. Of Mind. We're concerned that the right to payments under 5.4 of the SPA, that's not capital C consideration, <coughs> it's a separate clause which is not expressed to be for anything in particular. The license wasn't sold, but the shares in SUK uh, were sold, and the illustrative agreement was novated to BP, which gave BP the right to the oil of unknown value. Parties agreed, what can be seen perfectly sensibly as a commercial burnout style agreement for the payment of what was described as quotes a royalty payment by which the profits made by BP on the sale of Buck and Oil would be shared and they agreed that in the language of in effect computed by reference to. <coughs> That's better seen we say in context as a payment for the novation of the illustrative agreement. It's not contractually a payment for the working or the right to work Buckan since both of those were in KL, which I'll come back to. In Sol Petro's hands, that should have been seen as an Article 13.4 and an Article 13.5 transaction liable to capital gains tax, and there should have been no deduction in the payer, BP or Talisman, on the basis that it was capital expenditure. Be that as it may, the question for this court is whether Sol Petro and then later the bank, end up with a right within the fifth limb of Article 6.2. We say no. When you say it should have been liable to CGT under 13.4 and 13.5, that's on the Marin Ingalls yes. analysis. Yes. Under which each you, 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 each payment um, is, is a part disposal of the shows in action consisting of the right to payment. Yes. And if you had three payments, it would happen three times. If you have ten payments, it happens ten times. But none of it is income but none of in, it is in income. the hands of Sol Petro. Correct. Now, points to note on 6.2 itself. 6.1 is clearly designed to provide a source taxation rule, i.e. income from land, and we call it that in a state is taxed, or can be taxed in the state where the land is situated. 6.2 provides in the first sentence that immovable property has its domestic law meaning. I'll come back to the respondent's notice point in a little while. 6.3 then deals with a case where there is a transfer giving rise to a profit. We say and maintain that, that is the case that deals with the dealing profit made by someone who transfers by way of trade the rights that fall notion of immovable property. If you're not dealing, you have an alienation of a capital asset that's dealt with under Article 13. There is a, a, an overarching coherence point here, that if my learned friend is right, that 6.2 deals with transfers in the fifth limb, one has to ask, well, what is 6.3 doing? And indeed, one has to ask further, what is 13, and in particular 13.4 doing. I'll come back to that latter part in a moment. We say, properly understood, the reference to income from rights to payments given as consideration for the working or the right to work the oil is a reference to payments made to the grantor on the occasion of grant and not given to 
signed or on the occasion of a trump. That gives a coherent effect to the whole of the treaty, reading 6, 7, and 13 together, with, in the case of oil, 27a. Equally, we say Article 6 is clearly designed to deal with exploitation by way of use, whether that's direct use by the person who owns the land, or by letting use to another. Either form is exploitation by way of use. Small point, my learned friend suggested that my case rested on use only being contractual. Not so. 6.2 could deal with compensation paid for breach of right, i.e. illegal use. But the significant feature of that is it will be compensation paid for illegal use, that compensation being paid to the person who could otherwise have lawfully granted use. The effect of that is that the person who provides the use of the asset is charged a tax under Article 6. If you're a dealer in movable property, you can be taxed under Article 6 where you make a profit, otherwise you're taxed under Article 6. My only friend then says, well, consideration where it appears in 6.2 can't be used in a technical English law sense, but must be given a, an international <coughs> treaty meaning. And he's right about that. It is a treaty negotiated between the two contracting states. What he then posits as a reading of consideration is some phrase such as in return for, which is true as far as it goes, but again, one has to read that in the context of Article 6 as a whole and of the treaty as a whole to understand that where you see consideration, as you think of that as in return for, it is in return for the provision of the use of the asset. My lady asked um, my lady friend a question about well, what, what is said to be the immovable property here is the right to the payment. If you think Article 6 is about a source taxation rule, where you're looking to the situs of the immovable property, how do you go about determining the situs of a right in these circumstances? I think my learned friend was minded to suggest that you determine the situs of the right by looking perhaps to where you could enforce that right. Here we have an English law SPA with a, a UK company as a counterpart. That would produce then a very different answer had the counterparty here being a US company, or indeed had the transaction between two US entities. And yet the underlying oil would still have been in Buxton. Uh, equally, um, one can postulate that um, it hadn't been a transfer in return for a series of payments, but let's imagine a transfer in return for a loan note series of gilts that would pay interest. The import of my learned friend's case is that that interest on the loan note or on the gilts would be sourced in the UK under Article 6.1, irrespective of the situs that you might otherwise arrive at for the consideration. And my learned friend, when pushed on this, fell back to saying, well, Perhaps you don't need to answer it in that way. All you need to know is that the natural resource here, the bucket field, is in the UK continental shelf. But that's not what the article is asking here. But if the right is the immovable property, you've got to determine the situs of the right. Now, all that shows in our submission is that the starting point is wrong. The right to the sum here computed by reference to the sale of oil Would not be seen as immovable property in the Article 6 sense, where it arises not by virtue of the grant by a grantor, but on the occasion of a transfer by an alienate. So it's not sufficient for my friend to say, as he did about this point in his submissions uh, this morning, 
that Article 6 is designed to cover everything that has a sufficient link to the resource, whether that be the oil or the coal or the tin. There is a grave danger there that the case proves just too much. Now, what is the significance of the fact that Article <coughs> 6 2 does not have the computed by reference to language? I mentioned in opening that Canada has other agreements where that language uh, was adopted. We have copies, if it would be helpful to the court, for those of the treaties with uh, Brazil, Papua New Guinea, and Denmark. And they contain that computed by reference language that is not in Article 6 in our particular treaty. My well, friend, in effect, said, well, you can't, you can't look at those. They're different, different treaties. Uh, and our stance in reply, as it is as it was in opening, that they are relevant material. I do not say they are determined. This is a slightly arid debate, perhaps, because what my only friend didn't address is that these two contracting states in this treaty adopted the computed by reference to language in Article 11.4. So there was a conscious decision on the part of these parties to this treaty to deal with one part of the taxation of interest by looking to an amount computed by reference to a commodity price. Well, my friend offered no answer to that. So even if this court were not to look at the other agreements that Canada adopted to, one cannot ignore what is in this agreement. Another small, small point just to note whilst we're here, if you turn up Article 13.4b, <coughs> you will so see... So you were referring to 11.4? 11.4. Page 49. Page 49. <coughs> but whilst we were here, can I just invite you to, to note, so I anticipate you have it well in mind, uh, Article 13.4b. which has the, um, the benefit of language. Now, the point can be made, and I confess it didn't occur to me um, in opening yesterday, that that's an example of the parties to this agreement using for the benefit of, in contradistinction to the language they've used elsewhere, of computed by reference. I accept they're in different articles, but they're in different articles of the same treaty, where one can infer, at least, that the parties thought they were two different effects. Sorry, two different effects between which? Between the language of the benefit of in 13.4b and the computed by reference to language in Article 11.4. it may be said against me that they're dealing with different things in different articles, and I quite accept that. But they are different linguistic formations, pointing up a point I'll eventually make in a while about the ambit of section 13, 13. There was a point uh, I made yesterday, um, but didn't give you the citation for, just in connection with Article 11, I said yesterday that interest on a mortgage, i.e. secured on land, um, is in Article 11 and not in Article 6. I said it's in the commentary. It's in the commentary to Article 6. Paragraph two. Thank you, I found it. Um, I was looking in the commentary for Article 11 and couldn't work out why I couldn't find it. If you have it, it's uh, Volume 3, Tab 29, page 786. Um, well, if I made observations about the UK-US treaty, and he pointed to the difference of approach there where real property in that treaty is defined in Article 3.1m, in effect in the same way as the provision we're concerned with, um, there's a point there about the exclusion for a creditor, but that's not necessary in our case for the reason I've just given. But there is a difference in that treaty in Article 13, 
that treaty, there is a special definition of immovable property, and in ours, there is not. So that's another type of approach adopted by the member states in that case, where there was no assumption that Article 13, when it dealt with oil rights, meant immovable property. And if you have um, the commentary on Article 6 to hand, it's in the third volume of authorities, <coughs> tab 29 is the 2005 version can I just invite you to note before we get there page 767 which is the model article 6 itself it has our language in the fifth limb of 2 but 6.3 doesn't deal with any kind of alienation in the model treaty, there's no alienation clause in 6.3. And then the commentary on Article 6 begins at 7.8.6. As my Lady, Lady Justice Falk identified, 7.8.7, Canada reserved the right to include in paragraph 3 a reference to income from the alienation of immovable property. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you. So we can see that in our particular treaty, Canada has done that, the agreement with the UK. It has written in a type of alienation rule because it is not otherwise there. Now, Article 13 clearly covers alienation. You say the job is done in Article 6 for income. The dealers. Dealers. And that reservation is expressed in terms of income from the alienation of immovable property. Yeah. That word income is significant. So where you are a dealer, you have income profits from alienation, and that explains 6.3 in our treaty. If you make a capital gain, you're in 13. This is the point that demonstrates that alienation is not dealt with under 6.2, at least as regards Canada, Canada's understanding. Can, can I ask a stupid question? What are these reservations? Are, are all these states otherwise bound to sign up to double tax conventions in a particular form? They are not legally bound but they are, in effect, signatories to the OECD model tax project. And the expectation is, once you've signed up to the project, you will adopt the model. So the purpose of putting a reservation in is to put down a marker at that stage that this is something you will insist on when it comes to it. Correct. When you come to negotiate a new treaty between Canada and Brazil, Brazil knows that Canada has a reservation. And it's not universally true, but it tends to be the more economically significant Western OECD countries that have the um, <coughs> attitude of making reservations. I don't know how many countries are in the OECD. I don't know the answer. It's, it's nearly, nearly all of them now. Um, it might say at the I, I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't guess. If 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 someone behind me can find it in the bundle, we can we can give you the figure. But it's it's most of the significant world economies. But it is significant that 6.3 contains the reservation that Canada signalled in the model. And as my lady also pointed out, there are reservations there for New Zealand and Australia where they wanted to exercise domestic claims uh, as regards rights relating to oil and gas. 
very broadly defined, uh, more broadly defined than, than the language that we have in our particular um, Lisbon Treaty. So that's significant. Uh, Article 12, um, I had made the case in opening that <coughs> this is qualitatively like Article 6, payments for use, payments being made to the grantor, not payments made to a transfer or on the occasion of an assignment. Just for your note, it, when we come to the French text, Article 12 also in French talks about la concession. That's in the French text of 12.4 and the definition of royalties. But my very friend's answer um, to uh, our reliance on Article 12 was to say there's no necessary read across. His case, as I understood him, was to say, well, the structure of the two provisions is different and that one can't equate use and the right to use with working and the right to work. He says they're not relevantly similar. Well, with respect, we just disagree. We say that's wrong. There is clearly a parallel between the two. And what you're concerned with in the case of Article 12 is clearly payments for the use of the intellectual property. And one can track across from that to Article 6 to say that what 6 is aimed at is payments for the use of the, the real or the immediate they are conceptually the same. When we came to look at the commentary on Article 12, my own friend pointed to paragraph 18 of that commentary, which had something to say about the overlap between Article 17, dealing with artistes, and Article 12. He was right, that's what the article, that's what paragraph 18 is about, but I'm afraid I just don't see how that helps. And if one wanted to look at the 2017 commentary, one would see uh, paragraphs to like effect, although in the 2017 version, this point about Article 12 being limited to payments for use to a grantor is spelled out in even clearer terms in paragraph 8.3. You have the page number for the uh, Yes, it's, uh, it's tab 32. Uh, page 935. Thank you. Uh, as regards Article 13, my friend um, contended that the right to drill that is mentioned in Article 13 is an addition to the notion of immovable property. But he says you can't conclude from that that it is not already somehow covered by Article 6. <coughs> now, how he gets there is to say, well, the right to drill in 13.4a is different to what is sought to be taxed under the fifth limb of Article 6.2. Because in Article 13, concerned with the right to drill, that's the license, or the right to the oil once extracted, whereas under Article 6, what we're concerned with are rights to payments. And of course, strictly, he's right about that. But what principal justification <coughs> in the treaty as a coherent whole would you have for a that that which is conceptually closer to the land, say the right to drill and the right to take the oil, is not immovable property, but that which is conceptually further away, i.e. the right to a sum computed by reference to the sale of a movable, is immovable. reading down of 6.2 
understand exactly why he says that, but it's not true. We're reading 6.2 in context. We then turn to the French text. There's a little debate still as to whether it's formally part of English law. It is. Yeah, the tribunal were wrong. The key term when you come to the French text is la concession, this notion of a concession, concession for exploitation. He says there's no single fixed meaning of the term in French. <coughs> I quite accept that. He says it depends on context. I quite accept that. <coughs> but here it's in the context of a concession to exploit a mineral resource. And reading that in context, it is quite clear that concession was designed to deal with cases in which you granted to another the right to exploit your mineral resource. <coughs> and he objected at this point that we hadn't shown anything whereby you could see that notion of la concession meaning grant. We did. It's in the Canadian Revenue Agency where you can see a clear distinction drawn between grant and concession on the one hand and transfer on the other. Uh, he objected to the uh, citation to the, the dictionaries because, again, he identifies there's a series of possible meanings, nuances of meaning. Uh, and I was careful to say, I hope in opening, uh, but let me say now, that we do not say those dictionaries are conclusive. They're not. But they are clearly relevant material this court is entitled to look to, and they are clearly indicative that a distinction was being drawn in the French text between concession and transfer, or concession and cession. So far from undermining uh, our position, um, my own friend's um, exploration of the French text and the dictionary we say, actually, <coughs> the conclusion he didn't have to arrive at, that the, the French text is material and it is a useful guide. A couple of other points still on ground one. My friend thought to indicate, thought to contend, that one shouldn't draw a sharp distinction between a sub-license case and an assignment said, well, in effect, economically, they might produce the same result, so you shouldn't read the treaty as dealing with one type of transaction in Article 6 and another type of transaction in Article 13. But English law every day draws a distinction between granting a license or a lease or a sub-license or a sub-lease and selling or assigning the asset. That's a fundamental building block of the English law. And more significantly, it's quite clear that the drafters of this treaty did draw a distinction between an alienation case, 6, 3, and 13, and 6, which at least deals with grant. So to complain that there should be no principle to distinction between the two doesn't wash even as a matter of the My friend had a discussion, a short discussion yesterday afternoon with my lord about whether it matters that oil in the UK vests in the crown. So that if I were right about grantor in Article 6, there would be no grantor who would actually pay tax because the crown doesn't pay tax. I say no, that doesn't matter because that provision has to deal with the position in the case of both Canada and the UK. And it also deals with other natural resources over and above oil. Is oil in Canada not vested in the Crown, the right of Canada? Um, in some provinces, yes, and in some provinces, no. But more significantly, it's obviously got to deal with things like coal. I thought all coal had been nationalised in the 1940s. <laughs> no, but it also deals with stone, and tin, and, tin. and yeah. everything else. Um, my Lord asked yesterday about the oil prices, um, and we have got a table, um, and that actually tells a, a rather su 
surprising story because my living memory would always have oil price as being rather expensive. Um, and that's not been true. But sorry, if you're handing up, you mentioned earlier that you've got the other treaties. Yes. Just so you see what's coming, those other treaties are in English and in French, so the French doesn't matter very much here. Thank you. So just looking at the table, um, I want could highlight just below the first hole punch in 1986, when the deal was done. Um, and this particular oil was priced off what was called 40s blend, and that's provided for in the SPA. But just as a proxy, I think we should take here Brent. It's nearly oil, nearly all oil in the North Sea is priced off Brent. So you can see if one runs an eye down the Brent column, that in 1986 it was less than $20 a barrel, so it was a 14 odd. It hit above 20 in 90 and 91, and again in 96, but then it doesn't reliably stand above 20 until the year 2000 onwards. And then since 2000, it's been reliably above. And these are yearly averages, so the big dip when it went briefly negative during the pandemic is in those figures somewhere, but it doesn't So at the time the deal was done, oil was roughly $14 a barrel. And then it doesn't really become uh, a relevant feature for our story until 2000 onwards. Turning then to ground two, which is where my learned friend went next. My learned friend said yesterday, about 10 past four, it's on the transcript at page 156, line 23, that Solpetro is still turning rights in the seabed to account, and that's sufficient to bring it within Article 6. And there is no legal basis. captures what we say is the fallacy in the Commissioner's position here, so Petro does not have rights in the seabed at Buckham to turn to account. So the way my learned friend put the case this morning was slightly different. He said, well, what Sol Petro had was rights under the IA and or the right to the oil and or the shares in SUK. He was in effect inviting you to say that some combination of those was good enough. I say, no, no, that's not good enough. He has to be more specific in order to fit it in with the legal definition of immovable property in the fifth law. So what Solpetro had was the rights under the IA, which it novated to BP. What Solpetro got was the clause 5.4 right, But looking at the position before the SPA, my own friend points to the <coughs> illustrative agreement, <coughs> and he says rightly, well, Solpetro agreed to put up the cash, and it indicated that it would provide the work programs for that cash, and then the obligation is on SUK to carry out those programs in effect itself or through the office. And that's perfectly commercially sensible. If you're going to give somebody $20 million, you're going to give them some instructions as to how you'd like them to spend that $20 million. So that does not give Solpetro an interest in the license, because that was in SUK. It does not mean that Solpetro was working Buchan, because it wasn't. 
what my learned friend is driven to say is, well, really, some notional commercial reality, really, Sol Petro has the right to work in in Buckham by virtue of the right to direct the work and the right to the oil and so on. That does not amount to a right to work in the language of Article 6. What you have to have is a right to work the mineral resource. Salt Petro just doesn't have one can stand back and ask at this point, well, my friend is right that you have a right to work through your entitlement to the oil and the ability to direct the work and the ownership of the shares. Why then do you need Article 13.5? 13.5 assumes you can't look through a company. And then said, uh, well, BP had to buy all that it bought from Sol Petro in order to run the Buckham business, or that part of Buckham, and that's true. The question is not what did BP need, or what did BP get, but what was it that Sol Petro had to sell? Sol Petro simply didn't have the right to work. Well, this is all particularly galling because Sol Petro not having the right to work was the product of the regulatory regime that the UK government insisted upon at the time. And my Lord put it to my own friend uh, this morning that if one looks at the illustrative agreement rather carefully, you can see that SUK has the license, SUK has the the license obligations, SUK has the right to work, and Sol Petro is in the guise of a financier and the provider of the work programs. But that is not in any sense to give Sol Petro a right to work. And my Lord put it to my own friend, well, aren't you really saying that in economic terms the right to work is in Sol Petro? My friend said yes. And measured in that language, it's a perfectly reasonable conclusion. But this is a, in effect, a, a statutory or a treaty test that asks whether a particular right, a legal right to work, a particular asset, is in a particular entity. And a broad plea to some kind of economic reality, we say, is. Turning then to the respondent's notice, his first point was to say that whether he's right or not about the fifth limb of 6-2, we are in 6-1. And he gets there by saying, well, 6-2 first sentence requires you to understand immovable property in the UK sense, the sense of UK domestic law. And he says what the bank gets is income derived from the exploitation of Buchan, and somehow that is good enough. Now, strictly, once one reads the SPA, what RBC gets under clause 5.4 is the payments, and what is said to be the immovable property under the first sentence of 6.2 is the right to payment. Pausing there and maybe restating that. The bank has no interest in Buckham. What the bank has is a right to payment. The case has to be that that right to payment <coughs> is immovable property as understood under English law. Now, my friend got to that conclusion by starting with section 1313, what he wanted to say was that 
because you're taxable in that way under 1313, that tells you you must have the right sort of asset in order to meet the requirements of 6.2 and 6.1. Now, lady, I think, was putting to him, well, that's, you're starting in the wrong place. You're rather assuming ground three in your own favour. But, of course, on close reading, he doesn't actually need 1313 because the definition of UK in the treaty extends to the continental shelf. But one has to ask, what provision of UK law is it that makes the right to payment immovable property in the UK? Now, we don't have a concept of immovable property in the UK. We would talk in terms of real property. Thorny question as to whether it's English law or Scottish law. <laughs> Buchan is closer to Scotland. <coughs> Let's assume it's English law. Thank you, Mr. Buchan. Yeah. But for my sake, if no one else's. <laughs> it has to be said as a matter of English law that the right to the payment is an immovable. What part of English law requires that conclusion? That's never been explained to us. We've never looked at the Continental Shelf Agreement. We've never looked at the model clauses for license. We've never looked at this particular license. All the waypoints of where that argument may need to go. None of that's ever been put to the tribunals below or this court. What my friend is really doing is saying, this, there is a sufficiently close connection here with an immovable, the buck and field, and that's good enough. With respect to my own friend, that, that's just not, not good enough. So there is no basis, we say, on which, if we're right about the fifth limb of 6.2, that we are brought within 6.1 because of some UK meaning of immovable. His second respondent's notice point was to say that, in effect, once the UK government is through a gateway under the treaty, whether 6 or 13, it can tax an amount however it likes. <coughs> <coughs> and he refined that to a starting point that, well, if RBC are right, that Article <coughs> 6 is limited to grant, and uh, there was nothing sold by RBC so as to engage um, Article 6 under ground 1, or indeed anything in the case of uh, RBC under uh, Article 13, that must presuppose that we are in a game To that extent, he's right, because what the bank got was a right to a series of payments on the alienation of a right to oil and the shares in SUKL. But he then says, on the back of that, well, if that's right, you've got an alienation and we're in a capital gains world, the UK is then permitted under the treaty to charge those gains a tax as income. And he pointed you to that passage in the commentary to the 2005, uh, 2005 commentary at tab 29. But what that is saying is that if you have a gain that is taxable in a particular state in accordance with Article 13, that state can tax that gain as income. To give a simple example, there may be a capital gain on the sale of a plot of land. And that, in Article 13 terms, may confer taxing rights on the state where the land is situated. That state may say, if you hold land for five years, it's a capital gain. But if you sell land within five years, we're going to charge you to income tax. That will be a perfectly 
permissible approach for a contracting state to adopt. And so there was nothing wrong uh, with going into the funnel on the basis of gain for the purposes of Article 13, but coming out into the domestic world and charging tax in, uh, in a different way. In principle. In principle. Okay. But my friend wants to go further than that, because he wants to say here that there is ultimately a charge to tax on the bank in the form of a charge on income, which he justifies on the basis that there was a gain made on an alienation, the taxing rights of which are in the UK because of Article 13. He doesn't, he's not taxing the gain. There are three interrelated problems with that contention. In order to make it good, he's got to find a capital gain. A lady put it to him that gain is not a defined term of the treaty, so you've got to look to domestic law. That gain has to be to the extent of these payments. What we want to tax is all of the payments. So you've got to find a gain in the amount of these payments, and that has to be a gain in the hands of RBC. Now when it's pointed out to my friend that Article 13 proceeds on the basis that you <coughs> find the alienator of the asset who makes a gain and then you look to charge that alienator, he says, well that's true on the face of some parts of Article 13. But he says, well, that there's no such limitation on the face of Article 13.4 and 13.5. And so if one turns up Article 13... <coughs> Bless you. He says it's in 8 and it's not in 4 and 5. Uh, he, he's, he's wrong. So 13.1 requires you to find a gain derived by a resident from the alienation. So you've got to have the resident who alienates the asset. 13.2 looks at the alienation of movable property of a business or a person conducting professional services. So you know again you've got the alienator and the asset. 3 is also expressed in terms of gains made by a resident from the alienation of ships and aircraft. Eight refers to gains made by the alienation of property in which the alienator is to be taxable only in the contracting state in which the alienator is a resident. But he says, well, that, that language, that formulation is not in four and five. Uh, well, he's wrong about five, because five talks about the alienation of, of shares. And one needs to read six. The provisions of paragraph five of this article shall not apply. 6a and b are expressed in the particular alienator of the asset. So 5, once read with 6, also requires you to identify the alienator of the asset who is to be charged as tax on the gains. He's then left saying, with words in his mouth, well, there's no link in 4 between the gain made on the alienation of the asset and the, aid and the requirement that you can only tax the alienator. But it is quite clear in our submission that once one reads 13 as a whole, including 13.9 and 13.10, and the commentary on Article 13, which is in Volume 3, Tab 29, beginning at page 823, what the model envisages is a charge to tax on the alienator of particular types of asset in accordance with the location of the alienator for the asset. Because 13.4 is not a freestanding provision that allows a contracting state to find some gain and find an alienation of an asset and then tax anyone other than Not what the model is designed to deal with, and it's certainly not what 
these two particular contracting states um, agreed in our Article 13. And if one stands back for a moment, if Wallenfeld were right, it would blow a huge hole in all of the double tax agreements. Once you were through um, an Article 13 gateway, you would be in a position to tax anybody on any amount, provided you could find an Article in 13 which didn't overtly link the gain to a particular alienage. So for the reasons we set out in our supplementary skeletons, paragraphs 10 through to 15, that's not how these treaties are designed to work. <coughs> so my friend's second respondent's notice point, I'm afraid, doesn't, doesn't get him anywhere. Lastly, section 1313, uh, as I identified yesterday in opening, it's designed to extend the UK's sort of tax boundary, originally derived from Section 38 of the Finance Act 1973. Section 1313.2 deals with non-resident companies with oil exploration and extraction activity. So 1313.2 ensures that non-resident companies are deemed to have a permanent establishment of a trade to bring trading income into charge. My lady asked me yesterday, well, if that's right, what's 1313.1 doing? Um, and that is itself derived from section 38.1 and 3 of the 1973 Act. And it appears to be doing something different in that it is a general territorial extension to the corporation boundary. Whereas what, what is now 1313.2 is doing is dealing with a deemed permanent establishment of a non-resident company with a trade. OK, so it's not limited to trades, for example. It may help, but the, the provisions are now in a slightly different order. So what was 38.1 and 3 is now 13.13.1, and what was 38.4 is now 13.13.2. Okay. So they're doing slightly different things. So against that background, my friend says, well, the benefit of is clearly more than a right to or an interest in the oil. But what then is the scope of this notion of the benefit of the oil? This case is, well, a commercial benefit of the oil is enough. Uh, we say, no, you've got to be more precise than that. He began a submission to say that he must be right about that to stop a profit leak. But it was pointed out to him that his profit leak assumes the validity of the deduction. Of course, if that deduction in the hands of BP and Tasman is not right in raw, then there wouldn't be a profit leak. So one either has to decide whether that deduction in BP and Tasman is right, or one has to put aside the contention that one only friend is wrong, there's a profit leak. You can't have it both ways. A lady put to him uh, this example, in effect. I imagine that you have a contractual entitlement thousand tons of wheat. Now, wheat being supremely fungible, what you might get is any old thousand tons of wheat. So you have the benefit of the wheat, but you don't have the benefit of any particular grain of wheat. And that might be an example of what the drafter had in mind when he talked about the benefit of oil. Oil itself, of course, being fungible. As I don't know whether oil that came from Buchan down the pipeline to Grangemouth would have been mixed with oil from other fields. Oil from each field has a slightly different composition, and, and that affects its, its value quite ra radically. My Lord, it, it does, although quite a few fields share the same pipeline. So sometimes what you get out at the refinery end is a blend of what went in at the I, there is a pipeline between, or well, there was a pipeline yes, between. But, but we're not we're not looking at the facts of this case. We're to construing the legislation. We are. So you have to contemplate 
both oil and gas being in effect fungible, whether it's molecules of gas or barrels of oil, the benefit of the oil, perfectly, perfectly reasonable phraseology to deal with a case in which you have an entitlement to a measure of the hydrocarbon without having a legal interest in any particular hydrocarbon. But what it doesn't have to extend to is a payment <coughs> computed by reference to a price of a barrel sold. Because here we're in a domestic context, nothing to do with the <coughs> treaty. My learned friend is right, then it is the case that a lender who lends to an oil company on a project basis with that finance either in terms of principal or interest to be paid <coughs> and computed by reference to barrels extracted or price of barrels sold would on the learned friend's case be inside the ring fence. You say we're purely concerned with domestic but we have, there's the same language Treaty. There is, but I'm I'm assuming that I've, for, for one reason or another, I've lost the argument about the treaty. But my lord is absolutely right. That same language is in there. But there is the point that the language, as you pointed out earlier, has both the benefit of wording and elsewhere the computed by reference. Yes. To. And if if I were allowed to borrow from the treaty in a 13-13 world, yeah. which I accept I'm not, but if I were, I'd be pointing up the difference between by reference, computed by reference to in Article 11-4 and the 13-4B language of benefit. Yeah. Why, why do you accept you're not allowed to look at the treaty when construing 13-13? Um, because the, the latter, the UK statutory provision, has to be construed in accordance with If there were a reading of it that were mandated by the UK's treaty obligations, I can make that point that this court shouldn't arrive at a reading that would put the UK. It's, it's, it's a familiar principle that where domestic law is intended to implement a treaty obligation, you can have a look at the treaty to construe a domestic law. Yes. But in this case, the language. I mean, 1313 is designed to identify what falls within the UK tax net. Yeah. Necessarily, that's, that's bound to engage questions of what are the UK's international obligations. My, my Lord, yes. So, do you not look at the UK's international obligations if you construe that way, where the language is identical? Um, I say you, you do and should, because you shouldn't arrive at a different conclusion on the same language once under the treaty and then again under the statute. What I can't say is that this statute was designed to in implement exactly. this treaty, yes. because they're the wrong way around. Yes. And I can't say that an adverse construction of 1313 would, would necessarily put the UK in breach of its treaty well, that's the point that the it's accepted that the treaty obligations would, if appropriate, override, yes. prevent the UK taxing this income if it was otherwise. But it, it is a point we made below that if we're wrong for, a, for, for any reason about the treaty and you get to the statute, you have to arrive at a conclusion on the statute that respects the reasoning on the treaty if insofar as you're concerned with the same language. Well then we're not quite concerned with the same language on the treaty. But so so if you fail on six, on straightforwardly on ground one, you don't get into this. We don't get do you this. because the benefit of language is in Article 13. Yes. So there isn't a direct barrier. What I was hoping to point out to the court is that, yes, there is the same language. I don't think I can directly pray it in aid, 
the court shouldn't arrive at a different conclusion on the one head compared to the other when the language is the same. Thank you. But the point I made in opening that this case is a very a nice intellectual problem that arises on a very odd set of facts, but it does have wider significance because of this ambit of the ring case. That's where that, that point comes. Now, I quite recognize that doesn't get me home, and this court will arrive at whatever answer it arrives at, <coughs> but it does have wider significance than just our case. Uh, and I think that's all I need to say on, on section 1313 um, by way of reply, unless I can help the court any further. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Peacock. Uh, no, um, may I thank everybody uh, for their very helpful uh, submissions and for their patience, uh, with me at least. Um, and to thank those not just in the front row, but I'm sure there's an enormous amount of work which has gone on uh, in the rows behind. Um, as you'll expect, we reserve our judgments. Um, and uh, you will all be very familiar with the way in which things are done in this court, uh, our drafts uh, will be uh, circulated as drafts uh, for um, correction as far as uh, typographical errors are concerned, but not for re-argument, thank you. And um, uh, we must remind you about the uh, embargo, uh, and we've received, uh, I think, the um, addresses, the email addresses of those, uh, to whom the uh, drafts would go, but the, as you will well know, the embargo is taken extremely seriously, so please, please be careful about how you circulate the drafts. You'll also be completely and utterly aware that we deal with um, uh, consequential matters on paper, so we hope that you might be able to agree an order. Um, if not, please make very short uh, submissions in writing and it will be decided by the court on, on the papers. Um, I don't think there's anything more to add other than to thank you all again.